All right, I think uh, I think we're we should get started, and I'd just like to welcome everybody to to today's uh, CBR seminar, which is a special day because today's the day that that we are awarding the the Michael Page Award, and we are uh, going to have a talk from this year's winner, who is Allison McAfee. But I'd like to start by asking Ross McGilvery to uh, say a few words about Mike. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Christine, is, could you put my slides up, please? Perfect. Can you see my mouse? That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. We can anyway, see. so th thank you all for uh, joining this uh, event. So th for those of you that don't know me, I was a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology and a member of the CBR until I retired and took early vacation in uh, late 2017. So uh, we've actually had this event going for nine, nine years now, and it's in celebration of uh, Michael John Page, who was a graduate student in my lab in the late 1990s to early 2000s. So um, next slide, please. So Michael was a, a, a high school student at, in Thunder Bay and he went to Port Arthur Collegiate, which is the uh, high school there where his father Roger taught upper level physics and chemistry courses. So uh, Michael graduated in 1994, next slide, went to Carlton University in Ottawa, where he did a BSc in biochemistry, graduating in 98. And then he came to my lab at UBC, next slide please, to do his PhD, which he completed in 2004. So <clears throat> next slide please. Michael was an exceptional graduate student. Which, um, he was incredibly productive, uh, publishing uh, five papers. He was really good at training other students and also in collaborating with uh, other people, both in the department and outside the department. And this is one of uh, his papers, <coughs> excuse me, from his uh, <coughs> PhD. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in which we collaborated with Natalie Stranadka's lab, as well as Tui Lam Wong in Calgary, to actually express a bacterial trypsin. And then Michael was introducing mutations to try and alter the, the primary substrate specificity to get it more like a human blood clotting uh, protein. So uh, next slide, please. Michael was always able to get his own competitive grant support uh, from Canadian Blood Services. Uh, here is with me and Michelle Sewell, who was Dana's executive assistant uh, at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said, Mike was also very good at training others. And one of the people he trained was uh, Mark Blakely who literally was a graduate student by day, and he was a bouncer at Derby's at night. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, he fitted the profile perfectly. He, uh, Mark graduated in 2011 and went to Australia, where he's currently a faculty member in uh, Melbourne, and probably locked up at the moment at home. Next slide, please. Michael had a wonderful work-life balance. He, he worked incredibly hard, but also enjoyed having a drink with others on Fridays and any other day. Uh, he was also a passionate Vancouver Canucks fan, forever disappointed by their performances, but always uh, putting on his Luongo jersey here and watching Canucks games on TV with his dog. Next slide. After leaving Vancouver, uh, Mike went to Washington University in St. Louis, where he worked with uh, Enrico de Serra, this gentleman here. And again, Mike was incredibly productive as a 
a postdoc and then a junior faculty member in uh, in uh, St. Louis. Uh, Enrico does not give praise easily, but he said uh, that Mike was incredibly productive, some of the best work ever. His fellowship applications to the American Heart Association scored in the top one to three percent, and Enrico missed his ingenuity, knowledge, and enthusiasm. So again, Mike had academic excellence as well as a, a real joy of life. Next slide. From there, Mike took up a junior faculty position and fellowship at University of California, San Francisco, working with Charlie Craig, who's this gentleman in the middle here. Here's Mike. And next slide. In Charlie's lab, uh, Mike developed this idea of getting peptides, labeled peptides, that would be targeted to, uh, or sorry, generally distributed around the body. And then they would have a specific protease targeting sequence at the end. So in this peptide, the marker is the imager, there's a membrane binding module, and then a protease targeting sequence. So that if you're, if you're looking for a particular protease activity, it would cleave this uh, hydrophilic part of the peptide away leaving this hydrophobic part, which would then embed into a membrane. And so there was an idea, a way of uh, localizing protease uh, activity in particular disease sites. Next slide, please. And this is some, it's an incredibly detailed, non-invasive imaging allowed the position of proteases to be shown in uh, even MRI slices like this. So with this, uh, this tool, uh, Mike and Charlie Craig started a spin-off company called BioPaint. Next slide. They applied for a patent, which was granted uh, last year. And unfortunately, after work one day in Oakland, Mike passed away very suddenly at age 36, uh, leaving many of us in, in great shock. So to try and keep Mike's name alive in uh, UBC, next slide, we started uh, a Michael John Page Postdoctoral Fellow Award. The first one of these was uh, awarded in 2013 making this year the ninth time that we have done this. And this was initiated with uh, support from Ed Conway as director of the CBR. And I think it was Roger Bramsey, who was head of biochemistry at the time, and then Roger Page and the Page family, who each were contributing funds to support this award. Uh, followed, and it used to be from pre-pandemic days, followed by a reception. And uh, recently, Roger Page has very generously uh, set up an endowment for this award so that uh, the interest from the award will keep the Michael John Page Award going in perpetuity. So I hope that Roger will say a few words at the end, but uh, meanwhile, I'd like to pass it back to Dana, who can introduce, next slide, this year's winner. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ross. And I, hopefully everyone can appreciate, uh, you know, why we all miss Mike and uh, why we're really glad that we have had the opportunity to have a named award for him. So I would like to introduce to you this year's winner, who is Dr. Allison McAfee. And I'll tell you a little bit about Allison. This is, a, this is a bio that she provided to me, so I'm just going to read it. So Allison grew up on a remote island near Knight Inlet, British Columbia. So that's out on the coast, not, not too far away from, uh, from the, the white bears out there. Uh, she was homeschooled with her sister, Carla. Allison majored in biochemistry at UBC and completed her PhD in genome science and technology in 2018 and she earned the Faculty of Science graduation prize. She now studies honeybee reproductive health 
focusing on factors affecting sperm viability in bees. Allison's research will help us better understand the biological processes underlying sperm viability and contribute to best practice recommendations to limit adverse exposure of queen bees to damaging stressors. Allison writes a monthly column for the American Bee Journal magazine, and her research has been reported by news outlets that reach tens of millions of people around the globe. When Allison's not in the lab or the bee yard, she can usually be found on the top of a mountain or training horses at the barn. So Allison, I'd very much like you to, uh, to take over and tell us a little bit about your research. Thank you. That was a really great uh, way to kick things off. And it was really nice to hear everything about Michael as well. Um, so thank you for doing that. And thank you very much for this award. This is a huge, uh, a huge honor to be awarded this. So uh, maybe the only thing I'll add to that introduction is that I'm also co-advised by David Tarpey at North Carolina State University. So I started remote postdocing before it was really a thing back in 2018. And uh, that's been hugely beneficial to me and he's really contributed a lot to my work. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. So in this talk, I'm going to go through a few different topics covering the dangers of temperature stress to queens and what temperatures are safe for queens to be held at and what are sort of the, thr the thresholds beyond which uh, we can consider the temperatures damaging. How can we mitigate adverse exposure? So like what can beekeepers do to try to keep their queens and colonies safe? And also uh, in sort of a twist at the end, what are the implications of temperature stress for actually combating infectious disease? But first, I'm, uh, I understand I'm supposed to talk a little bit about my extracurricular activities. So as was mentioned in the bio, I spend a lot of time training horses and I spend probably two to five hours every day at the barn, either rehabbing horses, uh, working with my own trainer, training them, exercising them. Um, that's a really big part of my day-to-day -day life. But beyond that, I also really enjoy science writing um, and science communication more generally. So I, for four years now, have written a column, Science Insider for American Bee Journal and have written other commissioned pieces for uh, the Gardner Foundation covering sort of the science behind what led the laureates to where they are today. And last year I published two op-eds in Scientific American about topics related to bees. So I'm also really engaged with the media and these two interests are, are closely linked because it's because of my guiding philosophy that I think it's part of our responsibility as scientists and researchers to engage with the public and communicate our work uh, when there's something important to, to be told. So I think that public engagement is uh, one of the best tools we have to create meaningful change. So speaking of science communication, I guess I'll tell you about my actual research. Um, so I've chosen to work on queens and queen bees, and that's because the queen is the sole reproductive female in a honeybee hive. So there's one queen in a hive, and she's responsible for laying all the eggs that will develop and uh, sustain the, the whole population of that colony. So as you can imagine, if something happens to the queen and she doesn't have as great of a reproductive output, then the colony population will dwindle and uh, eventually the colony could die. So that's if her reproduction suffers, but if she herself is actually uh, dies or if the workers decide to replace her, then a colony that undergoes this process of requeening is actually three times more likely to perish in, in the next three months than a colony that had a healthy queen the whole time. So it's a really risky, risky thing for colonies to have to undergo. And uh, I think it's something very important to understand to help sustain colony health. So the other reason why I was interested in queens, sorry, I'm just gonna get my pointer set up. 
Um, the other reason why I wanted to study queens is because they have this really, really interesting reproductive anatomy. So a queen will mate with around 16 different drones uh, very early in life when she's young and she'll acquire hundreds of millions of sperm from them that are deposited in the oviduct up here. And then over the next couple of days, a fraction of those sperm, maybe about 3% or so, will actively migrate into her spermatheca, which is this specialized sperm storage organ right here. A lot of insects and other animals have some kind of spermatheca, but in queens, it's particularly well-developed. And there the sperm will remain for the rest of her life, which in theory could be up to eight years. That's the oldest uh, documented queen that I've come across. So every time the queen lays an egg, she will actually choose whether she's going to fertilize it or not. So if you can imagine an egg sort of traveling down the oviduct here, it'll hit this, this curve in the duct, and then she can choose to fertilize it by sort of squeezing this sperm pump, which releases a median number of two sperm per egg. But it's actually a set volume of fluid that she releases, so that amount of sperm will depend on how many sperm she actually has at a given time. So the fertilized eggs, I should say, develop into workers, which are most of the population of a colony, and then unfertilized eggs will develop into drones, which are the males. So her reproductive capacity is ultimately sperm limited because as she lays more and more eggs, of course, she's it's like draining the bathtub and uh, she will have fewer and fewer sperm left. She can't go out and mate and acquire more. She only has one chance to do that at the, at the start of her life. So theoretically, she has a lifetime fecundity of around one and a half million eggs for like a, a good to average um, well-mated queen. And that's about six years worth of eggs. So this, however, queen failure is uh, really a problem for beekeepers. And uh, that's like if she dwindles in her ability to, to lay eggs. And that condition is linked to low sperm viability, which might not be a surprise given what I just told you about how this system works and how she fertilizes eggs. So that's supported by previous research that Jeff Pettis has done as well as some work that I published at the beginning of this year. And temperature stress has been proposed as a causal factor for this. And that may actually not be surprising because temperature stress is particularly heat is known to kill sperm in lots of different insects and uh, even mammals and and other other animals as well so it's a really widespread issue for fertility but if you if you happen to have a honeybee colony or know somebody who's a beekeeper then maybe you would know that the honeybee colony is actually generally considered to be a very thermoregulated environment that is quite stable, uh, even in the face of changes in ambient temperature outside. So there's a general thought that that queens probably wouldn't be uh, at risk of temperature stress, but there are actually two reasons why this assumption can break down. And the first is because there's actually a massive queen production and distribution industry where beekeepers can produce um, thousands or even tens of thousands of queens and then put them in these small cages that are maybe a couple cubic inches in size and ship them all, all over the world. So Canada actually really depends on this. We import around a quarter million queens every year from countries like the States and uh, other countries in the Southern hemispheres. And during that process, it's very difficult for the bees to thermoregulate. So there have been a few different studies that track temperatures uh, that the queens experience during these shipments. And this is just an example of some of that data that I published last year, where you can see that the temperatures they experience are quite variable. In this case, it was all the way from four degrees to 38 degrees. So that's one time when queens are vulnerable to temperature spikes. 
But uh, I also really want to push back on this idea that queens are, are safe inside hives because I think conditions are sometimes becoming extreme enough where it looks like the hive's ability to thermoregulate starts to break down. So this, we did some work um, looking at the temperature in different places inside a hive. And this was actually done by Jeff Pettis a number of years ago. He placed a temperature logger on each one of these 10 frames inside a standard size honeybee colony and then track the temperature during a heat wave. This was done in California. So this was the data from that. And uh, to interpret this graph, the darker colors are the frames that are on the outside of that box. And then the lighter colors are more towards the core. And so you can see that the temperatures on the outer frames was fluctuating a lot, like more than the core. The core was quite stable here around 35 degrees, but the, the frames on the outside really uh, varied in, and tracked with the ambient temperature outside. And for this colony, you can see that three frames in from the outside, the temperatures were still, um, still going beyond 38 degrees Celsius. So this is suggesting that there's still a risk of adverse exposure inside of a colony. And I'll point out that these were like standard full-size colonies, but there are a lot of cases in beekeeping where you might be working with a smaller colony that is uh, either half the size of this or a quarter of the size of this. And uh, I've always suspected that those colonies would have a lower capacity, capacity to thermoregulate. And some, some anecdotal reports from beekeepers has supported that that was the case in this past heat wave that we had in June. So I know of at least one beekeeper in the interior who produced nukes shortly. So a nuke is, is like a half size colony, like a starter colony. Um, this beekeeper produced a number of nukes shortly before the heat wave and uh, very sadly, actually half of them perished. So not just the queen becoming damaged, but half of those nukes actually died, which is a really uh, huge loss for that beekeeper. And I think just one more reason why we need to know and understand what uh, temperature stress can actually do to honeybee health. So that data shows a couple different ways that queens could become exposed, but it doesn't tell us what the critical thresholds actually are. Like in this previous slide, you know, is 38 degrees uh, damaging or is that okay? So we did some work to try to figure this out. And this again was, was an experiment spearheaded by Jeff where he exposed around 200 queens to a range of temperatures from five degrees all the way up to 42 degrees for different durations. And I'm then we measured the sperm viability. So whether how many of the sperm were alive versus how many were dead by this uh, very simple technique of fluorescent staining where the green ones are alive and the red ones are dead. So I'll just show the general trends. I'm not gonna show the individual data points in this part yet, but in general, you can see here that there was no effect, uh, no significant effect of the temperature for the one hour exposure, but for the two hour and um, four hour exposures, you can see this trend with the tails, sort of the dropping tails at either end of the extreme with this sort of maximum viability somewhere here, which is fairly close to a hive's temperature. And same goes for the four hour group. So that still leaves the question though, like we see that there's a, a significant effect on sperm viability, but what I wanted to know was like how far down this curve do you have to go before you say it's too much? So to estimate that, um, I first pooled the two hour and four hour viability data into one model to get kind of a better estimate of the trend that's happening. And then I had, I had to set a threshold. So um, I set a threshold of an 11 and a half percent loss of sperm viability as being like the tolerance level. And for reasons that I will get to in the next slide. 
And if you do that, then and then look essentially at where this line intersects, then you can estimate that between 15 and 38 degrees is kind of the I'll call that the safe zone or Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot and not too cold. But importantly, beyond that is uh, is for two hours or more is damaging to sperm viability. So that's a really a pretty rough estimate, I should say. It, you know, it's it's open for modification, but I think it's the best estimate that we can make with the data that we have so far. So where does that 11.5% come from? Well, it uh, I didn't just pull it out of a hat. I actually, a couple of years ago, did a survey of queens from throughout British Columbia. So from uh, you know a wide range of operations. And I measured their sperm viability, as well as the uh, number of sperm that they contained in that spermatheca uh, and the ovary mass, but I won't, I won't really get to the ovary stuff. So the healthy queens had a sperm viability of uh, just under, I guess it was maybe just over 80%. And the failed queens had significantly lower sperm viability as you would expect. And they were, it was lower by um, that number, 11 and a half percent. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just the data from one, uh, one survey, one observation, but I did confirm that there was a significant difference between failed and healthy queens in another survey the next year. And that time the difference was 12.3 percent. So uh, I think that it's good to go with the 11 and a half percent metric uh, if we're going to be making any kinds of recommendations for beekeepers because I think it's just good to err on the side of caution and use that lower tolerance threshold there. So in short, that's the sort of loss of sperm viability that I think we can consider to be a biologically and economically meaningful loss. So <clears throat> what can beekeepers do to mitigate that stress or maybe queen producers as well? Well, one thing is that I think it wouldn't be too difficult to improve the way that queens are shipped. Um, some other researchers in Quebec have shown that if you essentially dump a metric cup of bees into the, the shipping container that those bees can actually do a much better job at thermal regulating during the shipping process. Um, but that doesn't really work for international shipments because CFIA needs to be able to inspect the queens at the border. So you'd have to come up with a creative kind of box to allow that to happen. But uh, another thing that beekeepers can do is to buy local stock whenever possible, just to avoid the, the need for having your queen to be shipped in the first place. Um, that depends on the time of year. It's not always possible, but when you can, I recommend that. And, you know, during the heat wave that we had, it was really alarming. Um, nukes and even queens full on died rather than just losing, losing their sperm viability. So there were some real economic losses there. And that spurred a small experiment that I did with Emily Huckster, who is a beekeeper in uh, near near Vernon. Uh, and so there we just tested a couple different methods. This is really practical beekeeping stuff. We tested a couple different methods of insulating the colony. So having a styrofoam lid, like you can maybe see at the very top of the, uh, of the screen there, or feeding light syrup, which increases the amount of water in the colony and lets them um, be better able to perform evaporative cooling. Those were the two things we tested. And we found that, I'm not gonna show the data for this, but we found that having a styrofoam lid reduced the temperature inside the colony significantly. And that was by uh, 3.75 degrees Celsius, which is a pretty big difference. The feeding the syrup was only a marginally significant effect and it reduced the temperature by uh, 1.1 degrees. So I am now recommending to people that look after bees to basically always have a styrofoam lid because um, we can only expect heat waves like what happened last summer to become more frequent, more severe and, um, and longer than in the past, unfortunately, is what we should expect with climate change. 
So what does all of this have to do with infectious disease? Well, uh, I have, I'll take you on a little bit of a journey here. So back in 2018, I wanted to know what specific heat shock proteins become upregulated when a queen is heat stressed. So this might seem like a dumb question, but um, bees have dozens of heat shock proteins and presumably, and now my data demonstrates, not all of them are upregulated with heat. There are specific ones that will respond to heat in particular tissues. And so I found using proteomics that heat stressed queens upregulate uh, these, this set of five different small heat shock proteins that was in the spermatheca. And in the ovaries, they upregulate this heat shock protein 70. So specific heat, heat shock proteins are upregulated. And uh, if you can remember the, the queen survey I showed with the queens from all, all over BC that I looked at their sperm viability and sperm counts with, I also did proteomics on their spermathecal fluid. And thanks to a graduate student in the lab, Abby, uh, we also have viral data for those same queens. So then I wondered what proteins correlate with the with viral infection, essentially. And only six proteins significantly correlated. And three of those were heat shock proteins, which are the exact same ones that are also upregulated with heat shock. So there's this link between heat shock proteins and viral infection. And we, with a collaboration with Esmail, who's part of David Tarpey's lab in North Carolina, We've shown that when you infect queens with a different honeybee virus, IAPV, then they, uh, they respond by upregulating these same heat shock proteins. We've looked at two of them, we haven't looked at the third, but I expect that probably the results are similar, would be similar for those. So um, around this time, a lab in Montana, Michelle Flanagan's lab, also actually showed that the heat shock response is antiviral in honeybees. So they did a very simple experiment with worker bees, not with queens, where they infected the workers with a different virus and then heat shocked them. And the, the workers that were heat shocked actually cleared the virus significantly faster than the workers that were not heat shocked. So this uh, in combination with now uh, these patterns that we're seeing in queen bees, I think it's very likely that the heat shock response is antiviral in queens as well. And I should add that um, the data in Drosophila supports that these heat shock proteins are antiviral in, in that insect as well. So, one of my projects that I'm working on now is to actually try to kind of capitalize on this phenomenon and see if heat shocking queens before they've mated, um, so before they've acquired any sperm, if heat shocking them can actually help prevent sexually transmitted viral infections, which is a known transmission route within bees. They can, the queens can acquire viruses from the drones. So, um, it's, you know, maybe it's not all bad news, um, all this impact of heat stress on, on queens. There might be a way that we can actually kind of uh, use that knowledge to try to sustain queen health. So, of course, there's a lot of work that I have yet to do on that, and I don't have sort of a full story with it yet. Um, but maybe in the future, I can update you with if it looks like it'll be a promising approach or not. So the take home points here are that temperature stress kills honeybee sperm. And that's at cold temperatures and at hot temperatures. And that heat waves, and this I think is really my main message is that heat waves are a real threat to honeybee fertility and probably even more so to other insects, um, particularly like solitary bees or subsocial bees that are wild out there in the environment and that don't have such a capacity to thermoregulate like honeybees do. That 15 to 38 degrees is what I'm calling the Goldilocks zone for queens. And that's what I recommend beekeepers and uh, queen suppliers keep their bees in at, at all times. And that 
I am working on testing this idea that controlled heat shocks could potentially help protect unmated queens from sexually transmitted infections. So with that, thank you very much for uh, everybody listening to this and to everyone listed here who uh, had a role in this research and especially um, to, to you for uh, recognizing me with this award. That's a really big um, privilege and honor. And uh, I guess I'll say thank you to the horses too because they've kept me sane during this whole, whole pandemic, kept me happy, healthy and um, and satisfied. So yeah, uh, I guess I will end it there. Great, thank you very much, Allison. Really interesting presentation. I think we have time for a couple of questions. If, uh, if people, you can either put your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand. Are you going to moderate it or should I look for things? Uh, no, I think, yeah, I can moderate it. Okay. So Omid has a hand up, go right ahead. Hi, Allison. Um, really nice talk. Sorry, I should turn my video here. Um, yeah, really nice talk. I'm usually buried my head in my own field, so it's nice to hear something very different. Um, Thank you. I was kind of curious. I, I didn't know this. I've heard of HR proteins being involved in antiviral processes, but I don't really know how, how that works. Um, is there anything known about other systems, or what's the mechanism of these HR proteins being antiviral? Yeah, um, as far as I can tell, the exact mechanism hasn't really been pinned down. I'd be happy if somebody corrects me on that. But um, from what I understand, the sort of going, going hypothesis is that the heat shock proteins kind of act like oil to the antiviral RNAi machinery, that they somehow help facilitate um, like complex formation or maybe stability of the RNA-induced silencing complex. Um, so that is the explanation that I've been given by people who, other people who are working on this heat shock response. Cool. Thank you, congrats. Thanks. I, I have a question for you, Allison. I, my <clears throat> my uh, colleagues who keep bees really are, are more, seem to be quite obsessed about this mite that, that's been, been getting into the hives. And, and is the, is what happens to the mite at these high temperatures? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. I didn't expect anybody to have some uh, personal experience with bees here. So this is great. Um, I have two answers. One to answer exactly your question is that the mites are more sensitive to heat stress than bees. So there are actually uh, a couple a couple um, mite treatment strategies that have been proposed, not, I would say not like super thoroughly tested yet um, because uh, I of course worry that if you heat up a hive to 44 degrees, which is what's recommended for these treatments that you're probably gonna cause some infertility in the queens too. So um, that aspect of like, what's the impact on honeybee health, these companies, as far as I know, haven't really, uh, dug into, but there is a good body of research showing that the mites are, are sensitive to heat and will die before the bees. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I want to add to that is that mites are like one of the reasons why the, these parasitic mites are such a big problem for bees is because they transmit viruses. Okay. So um, the mites when they bite the developing bee, they'll, they'll um, sort of like inoculate them with viruses and it really contributes to spread of viruses within the colony. So um, that is just kind of an aside um, <laughs> that it's one more reason why viral infections are uh, a bigger problem now than they used to be before this mite was around. Thanks very much. Um, are there other questions? Either put up your hand or you can write something in the chat box. If not, then uh, you know our very warm congratulations for, for winning this award. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Roger Page, who's going to say a few words. Roger, you still Hello. Have... Can you hear me? We can. But you can't see me, but you've all seen a picture of me 10 years ago, nine years ago, <laughs> when Ross showed his slides. I don't think I've changed too much. Anyway, 
I am really unhappy that I'm not out there. For years, I have enjoyed coming out and listening to the excellent presentations by the research scientists. And uh, I guess that the second or third person that received the award commented to me that when they had the big gathering and young research scientists were getting together, it was a perfect occasion for that to happen because everybody's doing their own lab work in their own area and they never really get to meet with some of the others. So that is certainly a big miss. Allison, your presentation was excellent. And I was quite impressed with your background, even enjoying the horses. That one lady that I commented on, she was a flamenco dancer and she'd gone to Spain to study flamenco. So you can see the background is quite broad when it gets down to being a research scientist. So that's basically what I would want to say. Ross said just about everything pertinent to Michael. And uh, Michael <coughs> has a very big award, as you are aware, <coughs> excuse me, at UB's University of California in San Francisco, which you, of course, probably have pulled up on the internet. And uh, they named a research symposium uh, after him that's backed by over $100 million. So he definitely had quality. And that's, I think, it. So hopefully next year I'm out there and we have a function where everybody gets to talk to one another. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, we're certainly hoping that this will all be face to face next year and yes. we'll all be vaccinated and life will start to return to normal. So um, if no one has any further questions, I just like to bring this to a close and say thanks again to Allison and, and our work. Congratulations. <laughs>